Hello and welcome to Ask GMBN Tech. This is the show where we get to answer your questions. So if you have a question, get in the comments below, hashtag Ask GMBN Tech, and then maybe your question can be featured. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe if you're enjoying the content and hit that notification bell. Thank you very much and let's get into it. So first up this week, we have a question from Marion and they say, I have a RockShox Lyric solo air fork with 170 millimeters of travel. The fork serial number, which I won't bother repeating. When I enter the serial number on the RockShox website, it says it's a, another serial number. Can I upgrade the air spring to Debonair and increase the travel to 180 mil? Thank you and I love the show. Well, I'm glad you're enjoying it. Um, so when we're talking about length of fork and the maximum length, there are two things we're looking at. One is bushing overlap, and the second is actually damper length. What you want to be happening is, you want the air, air spring, the air shaft, to be the thing that limits the travel, not the damper. Because if you've been pulling on that damper each time, it will basically, eventually, just destroy it and pull it apart. Now, the most surefire way of doing this is on rock shocks. They actually have those little markings saying 10%, 20%, 30%, and at the different lengths to help you. This is a surefire way to know which length you can run. Um, I've got a set of these lyrics and mine say 170 and they also say 180 um, and that's yeah how you can be absolutely sure. I also ran those codes through the SRAM website and it is very ambiguous. Um, sometimes it depends on the model year, sometimes they can be you know there'll be like a, a 150, 160 lyric and there'll be a 170, 180 lyric. Um, so it is all a bit ambiguous, but if you do have that, um, those markings on the fork leg, then that is a surefire way to know that you just need to change the air shaft and you can take it up to a 180 mil fork. Next question is from Joe. And he says, how long can you safely run a set of alloy handlebars? I have a spank set on my bike and I've had them for three years. No major crashes, but recently I've started asking myself if maybe they might be due for a replacement. Well, this is a very good question. And it got me thinking. I started running it through my head and I thought, I'm gonna go straight to the source on this one. So we spoke to Ian Collins at Renthal, who, uh, for those that don't know, Renthal are kind of one of the household names when it comes to it comes to handlebars. And I asked him about some of the testing they undergo and what kind of limits we're talking. So I'll quote him directly. And he said, all Renthal handlebars are tested to and exceed the European standard um, through our data acquisition, we have identified that EN ISO 410 is very stringent, sorry, ISO 4210 is very stringent when it comes to the fatigue requirement. Handlebars, which pass the EN ISO 4210 fatigue test, will have real world use fatigue life, which stretches into multiple decades. When talking about Renthal carbon handlebars, they simply do not fail in fatigue. We have conducted multiple consecutive EN ISO 4210 fatigue tests and haven't yet had a handlebar fail. So um, really, really interesting. And basically it was, I kind of just took out a quote there. Of what, he gave me a huge amount of information. And um, wow, yeah, it's pretty incredible to think that they don't think in real life conditions you're gonna even begin to, uh, to get those handlebars anything near like their shelf life. So uh, thank you to Ian for sending that one in and giving us that information and hopefully it's helped you out. I've actually uploaded the full message from Ian in the description below, which uh, yeah, some good bedtime reading, lets you polish up on some handlebar tech. But um, yeah, it's certainly, certainly very thorough all they go through and um, yeah, it's good to know, Get straight from the horse's mouth, I suppose. Next question is a question from Will and he says, is there a way to fix top out? I have a RockShox Boxer fork from a 2015 Saracen Mist and um, with Pro Coil. So yeah, you sometimes on the boxes do get a bit of top out. Top out is kind of at the very initial part of the stroke. As it comes back it, um, on the rebound and it goes to full travel, it kind of knocks. Um, this one is a really simple fix, um, at least in my experience. With the boxes, with the springs, you can get what they call top out spaces and they sit, you take that the, um, the top cap off 
and you basically just pad them out, much like you would do for a rear shock. You want it to be just under tension, not compressed, but just under tension so it can't just slide long. And um, yeah, simple as that. If you don't have the spacers and if you're in a hurry, people have been known just to put coins in there, but um, I wouldn't know anything about that. Next, we have a question from Philip and he says, is there a reason why they don't make threaded headsets? in a way they make threaded bottom brackets, not the old style of threaded headset, I, I think you know what I mean. Everybody seems to prefer threaded bottom brackets over the press fit variant, but nobody seems to care about press fit headsets. Well, this is a good question. So let's look at our bottom brackets and then we'll go back onto headsets. So bottom brackets, the threaded type uses what we call a BSA standard, um, which basically is the British thread, God save the Queen, obviously. Um, and what that means is that they both, one side in bottom brackets, it's the drive side, has a reverse thread. Similar to how with pedals, the non-drive side has a reverse thread. Now, why is that? Well, it's so when your bottom bracket is operating as it should, it will be tightening it into the frame. And if it is starting to seize, what would happen theoretically, or so, so it goes, is that it would begin to loosen. So I hope that makes sense. Now, when we look at this, so let's look at the non-drive drive side of the bike. And so you're thinking, okay, cool, so that's got a standard thread. So it's going around, I'm gonna do it here. So it's, it's tightening in that way. And then your crank, the lever, is passing over the top. Well, wouldn't that make the bottom bracket loosen? Well, then you need to go a bit deeper because you've got to think the inboard of the bearing is turning that way, which means the outboard of the bearing is turning that way, tightening the bottom bracket. I hope that makes sense. So with that in our, in our heads, let's go back to our headsets. Which ways would you have the thread? Would you have it both, you know, standard thread? Would you have one type? What happens if you do a lot of left turns and more right, it could potentially lead to issues over time. Um, yeah, I also imagine there's maybe something to do with engineering and kind of compressing it like that. It's probably just, yeah, press fit bottom bracket, press fit headsets. Um, I don't think are kind of are the enemy in this regard. I used to get some cool stuff from Common Style that used to have a pinch bolt, so you could change it for racing and stuff like that. But um, yeah, we wouldn't be able to settle on a uniform rotation for those threads, so press fit is the way to go. Next, we have a question from Andres. Andres, 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 Andres. That, I'm happy, Andres. I'm walking away. I'm moving on to the question. And he says, Andres, no, Andres, no, sorry, right, hi. I got a Trek Fuel EX 9.9 2018. It has a Fox 34 fork with 130 millimeters of travel. I'm wondering if I can get a Fox 36 with 160 mil of travel. I'm focusing on Enduro and I think this extra 30 mil would be great. What do you guys think? Um, would it be dangerous for the frame? Um, I mean, we get asked this question a lot. People wanting to, you know, Endurify beef up their bikes. So the big measurement we need to go for is an axle to crown. Some forks with a certain amount of travel might be very long in terms of that axle to crown. Some might use that space more efficiently. So you need to compare those two numbers. They'll, they'll be available online for any fork quite easily. Now, you're not, it's not gonna be a case of the head tube is just gonna rip off. That's not what's gonna happen. The issue is it's going to jack up the front of your bike, which will then slacken the seat tube, it will raise the bottom bracket. So if you wanted to maybe save your bottom bracket height, you could then introduce some offset bushings and all this sort of stuff, but you're chasing around a problem, a problem around the bike. You know, those, if you put 160 mil fork on this bike and you try to rectify the handling, it would always have a knock-on consequence. And although it's very easy for me to say, because, you know, I, I sit here in my ivory tower and say, huh, you can't do it. I understand why you'd want to do it. But I think it's it's probably not gonna be the um, the kind of golden ticket you think it's gonna be. It's gonna really, really increase your front end height, increase your bottom bracket height, and make that bike into something it was never intended to be. So um, the Fuel's a great bike in that 130, 140 mil category. It's just a sensational bike. Personally, I wouldn't put 160 mil fork on it. 
by all means, try it, be your own, um, be your own judge, but it probably wouldn't be for me. Now we have a question from somebody who I actually don't have the name of, so apologies there, but hopefully you'll recognize your own question. And they say, I want to replace my rear tubeless tire and I got a pretty strange problem. I'm intrigued. He says, when I use a Schwalbe valve, the wheel is losing air at the lower seal of the tubeless valve itself, okay? When I use a Stans no tube valve, the air is leaking at a spoke in the opposite side of the valve. I'm fighting with this now for over two weeks. Holy Toledo. And I think I'm going insane with this wheel. Well, I'm not surprised. That sounds, that sounds like a loveless marriage there. Do you have any experience with a problem like this and any kind of solution for it? Um, would it make, make sense to change the rim against a completely solid one? Which leads to the next question, are these rims still available? Um, one question at a time. The solution for me, most tubeless problems come from tubeless tape being incorrect. I would start again, take it all off, really clean it thoroughly, um, make sure it's all nestled and seated well. Then obviously the sealant's really important and, um, and making sure you have a tubeless ready, decent quality tire that hasn't got too many issues. Um, you know, if the, if the tape is good and the tire is sitting on the bead with sealant in there, then the rim actually is almost irrespective of that point, just in terms of getting it set up tubeless. Um, you can get those uh, UST rims like Mavic used to make and stuff. Some companies still do make them, although they are less common than they once were. But tape would be definitely my first port of call. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think you need to change your rim. It's gonna be tape, I'm pretty sure, 90% sure. 95% sure it's gonna be tape. We actually did a video dedicated to a very in-depth and kind of long form look at setting up tubeless. So let's check that one out. Now it's time to put our tubeless tape on. So the rim is quite important. You wanna make sure that it's wide enough to cover the well. And where you start is up to you. Personally, I find my valve hole and I go a quarter of a wheel back to about there. And then I'm gonna loop one full rotation and a half to end up past the valve hole. This just means that it is double covered here, which I think sometimes does help get a better seal for, uh, for the valve, really. There we go. Now we want to do something like a little shimmy here, just side to side to make sure it gets right down into that well. We're just gonna smooth afterwards. You don't want to get any air trapped under here, and that's really important. Think about it like laminating a sheet of paper. You don't want those big patches because if they burst, then you know your whole tubeless system goes out the window pretty much. Now it's a question from Tom and he says, hi guys, I recently bought an X demo bike online and when I received it, I realized it had European brake set up. So that's when the left brake is the front and the right brake, brake is the back. What is the best hassle-free way to swap the brakes to the right way around? Also, if you could please explain fitment de details of chainman guides. I bought a nuke-proof Scout comp and I've heard it's difficult to find a chain guide that fits because of its boost setup. Okay, so first question about swapping the brakes. It depends what brand they are. Avid, you can just undo them and they are made to be flip-flops, so a formula. Um, if it isn't, if, if it's one of the other brands, such as Shimano, then not to be, you have to swap the hoses, which isn't a problem. Now there's one way you can definitely make it easier. I want you to go down to each caliper and gently with clean hands, big time clean hands, use it just to gently tease the disc rotor one way or the other, just to push the pistons back into the caliper a bit. This is gonna basically reduce the chance of you needing to bleed your brakes when you swap the, when you swap the, um, the hoses. So once you've done that, carefully using an eight mil spanner, uh, un undo those, uh, those nuts there and quickly and succinctly, but not so much you're waving it around like a lasso. You don't want to be just flying oil everywhere. You want to be doing it really slowly, smooth, and just feed them in through the other ones, tighten them up. And um, sometimes you can get away with not having to bleed them. Uh, probably worse, you probably need to leave a bleed them, but it's, uh, it's not that much hassle, probably relatively cheap at a bike shop. Um, in regards to the chain device, chain devices, where they sit and how far out they sit is usually determined by spaces that sit between the device itself and the frame. Um, if you bought a chain guide new from you know, E13 or 1UP or Shimano, 
it will come with that um, that hardware as stock, um, different different length bolts, different length spacers. Ones like that new Shimano one are actually pretty cool because the whole device itself is on a barrel adjuster, which makes it really, really easy to fine tune your adjustment. Um, but yeah, they usually come with the hardware. I think you'll be right on that one. You, you'll be able to work it out. I've got faith. So there we have it. That's another episode of Ask GMBN Tech wrapped up for this week. If you're sitting at home thinking, oh my God, I need answers. I need answers. Ask GMBN Tech, hashtag in the comments. No hesitating. I haven't really got into that. Moving swiftly on. If you want to stay with the channel, click down here for Bernard Kerr's Jewel Worthy Pivot, which was absolutely sensational and a real pleasure to look at. And if you want to see our in-depth tubeless setup, click down here. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe and thank you very much. We'll see you next time.